we have an incredible all-star panel today. John Dye Harrell is a founder and executive director of the Center TCRC Community Healing Center in Philadelphia. He's a dynamic advocate with 25 years of personal experience in mass incarceration. His mission-driven organization addresses food scarcity, community building, and reintegration of formerly incarcerated individuals. He holds uh, roles in organizations like the Philadelphia Reentry Coalition and Philadelphia Anti-Violence Coalition. So, uh, John, I thank you so much for joining us. The Dr. Reverend Kelly Brown Douglas. She's the interim president of the uh, Episcopal uh, Divinity School. Uh, she is a internationally noted theologian and canon theologian at the Washington National Cathedral, as well as theologian in residence at the Trin at Trinity Church Wall Street, which is a long supporter of social justice work. Uh, she's been an Episcopal priest since uh, 1983, and she has a master's degree and PhD in systematic theology from Union Theological Seminary. She has written six books, including the award-winning Resurrection Hope, A Future Where Black Lives Matter. And she is a recipient of the 2023 Grandma Meyer Award in Religion. I'm sorry if I blew that. Next amazing guest is uh, Dennis Sinrat serves as the Executive Vice President and Chief Development Officer at the National Ur Urban League, an amazing uh, civil rights and anti-poverty and urban development organization. He has over 30 years of experience and he leads a team of, of many people uh, strengthening the Urban League. Before then, our lives passed when he played a crucial role as Vice President of Corporate Development at the United Way of New York City which has long-term been a, a strong funder of Hunger Free America and our predecessor organization, the New York City Coalition Against Hunger. His uh, leadership and commitment to the National Urban League contributes directly to the ongoing dialogue surrounding MLK's legacy and its impact on uh, contemporary social and economic challenges. And last but not least is my very old friend going back to high school, Jonathan Ike. He's the author of six books, uh, and before that, he was a journalist for uh, publications such as uh, the Wall Street Journal, uh, the Times Picayune in New Orleans, the Dallas Morning News, and most importantly, the Rockland County Journal News, where we both grew up. And I, I just talking to John before we start, I was remembering a piece he wrote years ago about uh, the uh, Sioux Indian uh, you know, re Reservation, the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, and as heartbreaking as the situation there is, as many urban uh, early deaths there were, one of the only thriving businesses was a, a, a casket uh, business. So he's been focused on the intersection between racial issues and indigenous people and uh, civil rights for, for, for a long, long time. Uh, before his recent book, on MLK. He wrote an amazing book on Muhammad Ali, which I uh, highly recommend is both entertaining and extraordinary and informative. And his most recent book, King of Life, has gotten all sorts of plotted. It's on more top 10 lists than David Letterman has. So I, I highly, highly, highly uh, you recommend it. And it brings out King as a human being and shows that if flaws that made him a very real human made what he accomplished even greater. And so I highly uh, recommend that just a really quick introduction before I go into our panel, why we're doing this. Uh, we've had, we at Hunger Free America have held a servathon honoring Dr. King's legacy for more than 15 years. It combines direct service and bringing attention to his, his, his message. Uh, just yesterday, we were helping uh, build in Bushwick, uh, Brooklyn, some outdoor cooking equipment, hopefully for weather's nicer, for recent immigrants to New York City from uh, West Africa. Uh, the Attorney General of the state of New York, Ms. Letitia James, uh, joined us. Uh, uh, the public advocate of the city of New York, uh, Jumani Williams, uh, joins us for that. Today, we did an event uh, with uh, our great partners at Repair the World. And yesterday's event was co-sponsored with Repair the World. This morning, we did an event uh, packing uh, uh, health products and toiletries for recent migrants coming into the city. And uh, Congressman Gerald Nadler uh, joins us for, for that. But we also highlight the policy message of Dr. King. There are two Dr. King quotes often affiliated with this uh, holiday. One is everyone can be great uh, because everyone can serve. 
And a lot of people misapply that to think that Dr. King was talking about just helping a food drive when, in fact, there weren't really food drives when he was alive because he was fighting for a more robust safety net. It was in his great drum major speech, which many of you know about and all our panelists can talk more about, was when he was calling for volunteering and serving in a movement for greater social change. And two, he also said just a few days before he was assassinated, fighting for the dispossessed, really uh, underpaid, dangerous work of, of uh, sanitation workers in Memphis, Dr. King said, what much does it profit a man to eat at an integrated lunch counter if he can't afford a hamburger and a cup of coffee? So not just the hamburger for sustenance, but the cup of coffee, goodness forbid, a little joy, a little human pleasure. And so Dr. King knew that economic justice and racial justice and nonviolence went hand in hand together. Too often today, his legacy is whitewashed, pun intended, to make it sound that he was just about kumbaya and holding hands and 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 just uh, and and the implication his legacy is finished. We're done. Uh, he's got a monument named after him and a day off, and so we are done on his agenda. And that's why we're holding this panel today on the full legacy. Of, of, of Dr. King. So I want to spend a minute just for the panelists to introduce themselves and really talk about how your life and your work intersects with Dr. King's message. And I'll go in no particular order, but starting with Dr. Douglas. I was hoping you wouldn't start with me, but <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thank you, first of all, for inviting me into this conversation. And uh, very significant conversation, particularly uh, as you have just suggested, uh, on this day when too often uh, we actually don't appreciate the fullness and and the radicality, if you will, and we can talk about that more of who Dr. Martin Luther King was and when we actually only celebrate a uh, romanticized and revisionist view of his I Have a Dream speech and of the dream itself. But we will get to that. You have asked how uh, his work, uh, uh, the work that perhaps I do and uh, the legacy of King, how those things intersect. Let me uh, say, answer that very uh, quickly, if I may. First of all, by saying my first introduction uh, to King in my memory uh, was through his I Have a Dream speech. Uh, in fact, when my mother, I'm from Dayton, Ohio, uh, born and raised there, and my uh, mother called my siblings, my two sisters and myself in from playing in our bedrooms to watch this speech, saying that history was being made. Uh, and so we ran in to see what kind of history was being made on television. I was immediately struck not only by the crowd of people standing there to hear this man give a speech, but by the way in which they were mesmerized by this man giving this speech, uh, let alone the way in which my parents uh, were mesmerized by him. So from that day on, I committed myself at a young age to sort of learning about, hearing about, following this man, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, what he did for me and my uh, young growing up, because I was like eight years old then, uh, and as I grew up and what King did for me was help me to understand. And you, one doesn't have to be Christian to really be committed to the work of King, to appreciate him, to be challenged by him, but I was. And so he helped me to understand really what it meant to be a uh, believer, a follower in a faith tradition that had a cross as its center. He helped me to understand really what it meant to bear the cross. And so that is the thing that continues to push me today in the ways in which he continues to help expand my own moral imaginary of what is possible and what justice looks like. And so that which I carry with me and that challenges my work is uh, the quote that King would make uh, famous, even if it was not, not original, to him, uh, but make known, and that is that the arc of the moral universe bends toward justice. I believe that it does. Uh, and of course, he said that it was long. And the way in which I am challenged by King in my work today 
is uh, what he did in relationship to that moral arc that bent toward justice. And that is he got on it. Uh, uh, and uh, so for me, that's the way in which King continues to challenge my work because I am challenged every day uh, to just get on the arc uh, that bends toward justice. Barack, President Barack Obama put it this way. He said, it bends toward justice that we have to help bend it. Uh, uh, and so that's the way in which I'm challenged and continue to be challenged uh, by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., recognizing that we aren't there yet. And so our task is to get on that arc that bends toward justice. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. Mr. Harrell, how does Dr. King's life and legacy interact with your work and intersect with your work in Philadelphia or nationwide? Well, what has always impressed me about Dr. King is his fearlessness in moving forward, his agenda in the face of tremendous obstacles. And in my work, I'm dealing with the return of individuals who are formerly incarcerated, which is a very arduous journey. And King had a journey which he never turned away from when the when it seemed as if things were darkness and they were not going to move forward, he still persevered. And perseverance, dedication, and belief, belief in change. In the work that we do, we live in a very violent society. Philadelphia is one of the five most violent cities in the country. Yet every day we seek to teach young people how to resolve conflicts, how to consider young people in other neighborhoods as their sisters and their brothers instead of, instead of adversaries. We work toward the food scarcity. And on a monthly basis, we feed close to 25,000 people. And that's a tremendous undertaking to gather together the food and the resources and the people and to make sure poor neighborhoods have access to quality food. All this takes a tremendous amount of work, a tremendous amount of endurance in the face of united opposition against what we know to be right. And Dr. King exemplified not only fighting to redress wrongs, but gathering together as many people as possible to support him and challenging those who were on the sidelines to either join and to be a part of this or realize that they are indeed part of the system, part of the problem. And we do this in our work every day. We continue to exhort, to encourage, and to lead by example in these three areas, food scarcity, conflict resolution, and reentry into society. And we have successes and we have failures, but none of that deters the mission and the work that we do. Thank you so much, Mr. Harrell. As, as you know, not only did gun violence take the life of Dr. King, it's taken the lives of uh, countless Americans since then. Most years in the last decade, there have been something more upwards of 15,000 gun deaths in America per year, which equals about five times the number of people who died on 9-11, just to put that in, in a, a sobering uh, perspective. With that uh, sad note, uh, Mr. Surratt, uh, talk a little bit about how your life and your work with the National Urban League intersects with Dr. King's message. Yeah, mine might be a little slightly different route. You know, I came from a very... A uh, strong activist family. My father was very much an activist, and um, in New York City, uh, you know, as a little boy, I went to more left meetings when it came to organizing to create opportunities in, in equity in the union world. Uh, I was just little Denny back then. I didn't know, understand what was going on, but I was learning along the way. And and candidly, in my mind, growing up, especially as a teenager. Uh, it was about Malcolm, right? It was about following Malcolm and understanding what the tenants there were. That was kind of what was uh, energizing me as a young person. It wasn't until my late teens uh, and early 20s that I really started uh, exploring, learning, and understanding Dr. King. 
Dr. King was really about systems change. It was about inclusion, but systems change. It was putting together both policy and ad policy advocacy and programs that were going to drive opportunity for everyone across the board, just in a, just across the board. And and so when I continue to learn about him, my life was already committed to the idea that any group of people that is denied food, shelter, clothing, access to education, access to a job with a fair wage, that was going to be my life one way or the other. And, and so uh, the alignment was connected and was there. Uh, when I chose to come to, as you said earlier, I stepped into the, the United Way, my realization was as a young person, so many of these organizations had great missions and they wanted to craft change, but what they could not do well was raise funds, right? They couldn't do a good job of raising the money that would that would support the work that they were trying to do. And so I said, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna couple this. I'm like, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in here and I'm gonna say that what do I need to do to get this thing done? Um, and so I started with United Way uh, to do that and we were very successful. Uh, for quite some time, as as you were saying earlier, when I chose the model called the National Urban League, it was very specifically because it was a national organization. It had been around a long time. Uh, it's in 36 states. It has 92 agencies, um, affiliates, as we call them. Uh, we are focused on same things that I talked about, food, hunger, health, jobs, um, you know, at an advocacy around that small business development, we have to be the solution that we seek. That's what we take on and say housing is a big issue. Uh, when we talk about the communities that we're serving across the country, po poverty in and of itself is a health issue that we have to tackle in many ways. So when I saw and understood the model that was driving advocacy and policy change along with programmatic outcomes in communities across the country. For me, it fit what it is that I sought to do. So February makes 17 years with the National Urban League, right? And, and very little have I not read about Dr. King because he drives so much of my ideology around what is effective change that could support people who sometimes find themselves in circumstances uh, that they can't control, but then I jokingly say, but I'm not really joking. Whenever some group decides to put lines around land and decide it's theirs and decide also that they don't have a responsibility to those that are in the lines, that's something we have to tackle and that's something that we have to take on. That's a lot of the work that we do. So more on that to come as we go through our questions. Thank you so much. I, I think we could probably have a five day symposium and just scratch the surface on the message and legacy of Malcolm X and the legacy and message of Dr. King and have endless debates, whether you could follow both at once, whether that's absolutely compatible or whether that's uh, contradictory. But I think uh, that's for another day. We will take that up that's and that out. <laughs> we'll we'll, we'll uh, talk to uh, you, know, Mr. Ike. Uh, you know, uh, do you agree? Would I say the three centerpieces of King's message and legacy were civil rights and human rights for all? You know, nonviolence, both internationally and domestically, and you know, uh, getting rid of poverty, hunger, and uh, economic inequality, and you know, economic empowerment. Do you agree? Those were the three pillars of his life. And if so, why did he believe so strongly that you couldn't uh, separate them, that they had to go hand in hand? Well, I think you're right that those are the three pillars, but overarching all three of those pillars is his faith in God. And I think that's why they go hand in hand for him. Um, and that's why he got into so much trouble because people kept saying to him, just stick to voting rights. You know, that's where you're most effective. Um, don't, don't distract the call from the cause. Don't, um, hurt yourself politically by speaking out on Northern racism, on housing in the North, on segregated schools in Chicago. Uh, keep your mouth shut about Vietnam. It's just hurting our fundraising. But he couldn't do that. He couldn't limit himself to any, to one pillar because he had this overarching belief in, and, and, and his faith in God was really what 
drove him to do everything he did. So he struggled really because people who were more interested in the political part of the process or people who cared about one of those pillars and not the others were often criticizing him. And that's why, and it's important to remember as we celebrate this holiday and we all seem to be a uh, loving king that um, in the last three or four years of his life, not just the very end, but for the last three or four years, he was polling very badly. Most Americans disapproved of him. And his own government, of course, was trying to destroy him. The same government that created the national holiday and the monument. So all of that, I think, comes in part because of his devotion and his refusal to compromise. And he could have played it safe. And we could argue, it would be another great symposium. You know, would King's legacy have been greater? Uh, would he have gotten more done? Would America have been changed more dramatically if he had focused his work only on the South and on getting more people vote, registered to vote and um, fighting Jim Crow laws? Um, did, he, did he damage himself politically by standing up for what he believed in? Of course, I, I, I'm proud, and I think most of us would agree that that um, part of the reason um, he's our hero is because he stood up for what he believed in. But it was complicated, and even a lot of his closest advisors were were urging him to be more practical. Right, and your book details the challenges he faced in Chicago and elsewhere as he brought his movement to to the north. But I always reinforce that the common perception that the war on you know, the uh, the Poor People's Campaign he launched was a failure, isn't quite true. As you know, after he was assassinated, Dr. Ab Ralph Abernathy, his uh, longtime close uh, associate, uh, led the Poor People's Campaign. Coretta Scott King was, uh, as you know, a, a key player in that. She, she went to Resurrection City, the encampment that the Poor People's Campaign started on the Washington Mall and said that uh, poverty is violence. And while it's often written that the the Poor People's Campaign was a total failure. It actually forced uh, the political establishment to create the modern nutrition assistance safety net because hunger reduction was a key, key tenant of the Poor People's Campaign. And that actually dramatically reduced hunger over the 1970s. And we almost entirely ended hunger in the 1970s before that was reversed in the Reagan era. So even, even though we know about his success on the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, I, I still maintain that the seeds planted with the Poor People's Movement were, were pretty critical in, in not just morally saying we should do something about poverty, but very concrete uh, results. Now, Jonathan, I, I, I realized I, I jumped to question one and did not give you a chance to answer the first question. Everyone else answered. How, do, how does you know, your work on King uh, overlap with the rest of your work and, and mission in life? Well, my mission in life is to write about the most important things that I can, where I feel like I can make the biggest difference. And if we think about what made King so special, well, in part, it's his great communication skills. He was able to speak to broad audiences in a way that seems almost impossible today, that he was able to get people to listen to him, even when they weren't sure they wanted to, to listen. They didn't weren't sure they wanted to hear what he had to say. And he was able to shine a light on racism in a way that um, really no one else at the time possibly could. Um, and I think that um, I, I, I don't m dare compare myself, but I think I'm trying to do some of the same thing, and that is, you know, shine a light and um, and and communicate what's going on in the world today, and make it just force people or ask people to think again about the world around them. Right. And Mr. Sunrat, did do you agree that we've got to address uh, racism, you know, poverty, and and nonviolence? Uh, to, together the way you know Dr. King suggested, and if so, why? Uh, they are absolutely connected uh, in in almost every way. You look at you look at the way uh, the country has criminalized poverty in many ways. You look at the justice system. You look at the, some of the the redlining that's going on. Redlining is not it's not called redlining <clears throat> anymore as much as it's zip coding uh, that's happening. That's keeping folks from creating equitable opportunities or just really the opportunity for them to have um, fair opportunities for their families and children and alike, schooling. All of it is connected. You, you, you talked earlier about hunger. Dr. King advocated for a universal minimum wage. And at the time he was only seeking $2, right? It was a way to create just a baseline opportunity for folks. That was one of the tenets of the March on Washington. And so the idea 
that if we you can't you can't separate the two the three of them in any way one exacerbates the other uh the very i talked earlier about the prison system that we're talking about racism poverty um it's driving policy in in local towns counties communities and states it's driving programs that are driving people out of the system so you can't if you're going to support as I say, a holistic approach to getting and maximizing what is our old, whole economic system, you can't create exclusionary policies. You can't create ways to move people out, but you have to find ways to move people back into the policy, into the system, if it's going to work for everybody. A lot of the work that we do here at the National Urban League is designed to, can, to, to reach out to the disconnected and move them back into the system so they can economically take care of themselves. So you can't drive one oh, only going to focus on racism because then you miss the whole economic picture. All right. If you focus on um, what is that? If you focus on poverty, it's too broad. You got to take some of it in pieces, but you got to connect the dot that they're all part of what is a systems change that has to drive that has to be driven through policy as well as uh, strong programs. And then you got to, how we do this, God help us, we don't know. You got to change this political system that we're facing uh, and actually gain traction and movement in it in such a way that that uh, won't create more division. We're in a space now where it used to be there was a healthy middle. And that healthy middle is missing right now. You're either watching Fox or CNN. Right, you either believe one set or the other set, but there's nothing in the center, and you actually don't hear the other side anymore. So, you know, if if we're going to tackle it, we all have to come together and say racism, poverty, and anti-violence work has to blend in together, and we don't have to agree on all different points, but we have to decide on the points that we're going uh, to really just push forward uh, and see if we can make lasting change. But it's got to be a, a deliberate approach that's going to connect both policy as well as program and advocacy if, is if we're going to be able to impact on anything in a positive way. I appreciate that. And as you noted, you know, the March on Washington was labeled the March for Jobs and Freedom. It was. Uh, we forget a lot about the, the jobs part. And I guess I'd argue, I think uh, CNN is pretty centrist down the middle. And, and so the, the middle would really be between if there was truly a left wing media outlet and the far right media outlet, Fox would, would be the middle, the, the center between the, the center <laughs> and the far right would still be the right. And so we, we and, and really, we need a fact based discussion. You, you know, I think you all test, you know, Dr. King was a visionary, but he was all, also very much a realist about what could get done and what you know, couldn't get done. And he was very much based on reality. And when the racists were insisting today might be Tuesday, he had said, look at the facts, today is, is, uh, is, is Monday. Mr. Harrell, so your, your, your work quite clearly focuses both on food scarce, scarcity and you know, nonviolence. So uh, I assume you, you agree those two things are tied in poverty reduction and, and, and nonviolence uh, and, and civil rights must go hand in hand. And uh, obviously there are, not obviously, but should be obviously, there are massive racial implications of the, disp of the unequal treatment of people of color in the criminal justice system. So why do you think these issues must go together? So, first of all, you can't even begin to discuss poverty without addressing discriminatory and racist practices that are built into this system. And the system is designed to create and to maintain a permanent poor underclass. Poverty is indeed violence against a group. And we've often seen throughout history that plans that would fundamentally change poverty are discarded. When you talk about redlining and and discrimination across the board in employment, home ownership. These are the foundations that a group of people would use in their fight against poverty. When people speak about reparations, that's viewed as a pie in the sky dream instead of a, a justified resolution of century old wrongs. 
that would really change economic realities. And economics is not viewed as a solution to violence. We look at violence in the inner city and across the country, and the economic factors are not taken into account. Yet, when we look at how to resolve conflicts, many of the same techniques that can be used to resolve conflicts between individuals, between gangs, can be used on a community and a national and a international level. We also need to understand how a the historically unequal distribution of wealth has benefited those who are in power and what has to be done to create change so, so that the outright suppression and the domination and the exploitation of black people can, can change. These realities have to be challenged and at present, they're not being challenged in a way that is beneficial for those who are the underclass of society. I believe that- Sorry, continue. Yes, um, Martin Luther King saw that racism was woven into the very fabric of American society. It's a part of the air that we breathe, the structures that surround us support the ideology of racism. We have to look at how this can be changed in real ways. Thank you. You know, it's striking that marijuana is now legal in so many parts of the country, and yet so many people are still in prison, sometimes many, many year sentences for marijuana-related offenses, and overwhelmingly, people of color are far more likely to get long prison sentences for any drug-related uh, offense, no less you know, uh, marijuana. So that is just, if anyone thinks, oh, this is something in the past, this is today, and, as you know. And Dr. Douglas, uh, I assume you, you agree all three of these issues need to be taken together. Why? Uh Yes, and uh, let me speak to this by sort of picking up uh, on something that Jonathan uh, said earlier and uh, as he began his remarks, and that is in what drove King. Uh, uh, and King was indeed motivated, driven by, shaped by his faith, by his Black faith. King was steeped in the black social gospel movement. And, and this is a movement that taught, right, that churches and those Christians had to apply the ethical commands of their faith to the struggle, the social political struggle against for, in the black social gospel movement, it was defined as sort of against the tyranny of, of white racism, the tyranny of white supremacy. Now, with that as his foundation and that into which he was steeped and as King would go on in school, et cetera, he would really come to understand and broaden his understanding, if you will, uh, of that tyranny. And it was a tyranny against the sacred dignity of every human being. King really believed, grounded it by his faith, and his further theological training in the sacred dignity of every human being. And so it was our task to create a society, to create a world, a future where the sacred dignity of every human being was respected. And in this regard, King thought that evil but that which was evil was that which was violent, and violence was that which degraded the sacred dignity, or as he would put it, degraded the personality of any individual, of any human being. And so it was that King fought for what he would later say, even as he talked about the way in which uh, racism, militarism, and uh, what he called ma materialism or poverty, how all of these things went together, what he was arguing for, and he used this phrase, uh, particularly in his speech, I think, uh, uh, against the Vietnam War at uh, Riverside Church the year before his assassination, 
he called for a true revolution of values. He called for a moral transformation of American society. And that for King meant that we had to pay attention to not only, well, as he said, the triplet of racism, militarism, and materialism. And so these things were intricately connected if we began to truly understand what King was calling for and what he was advocating. And that was a revolution of values. And let me say one last thing when we talk about uh, his commitment to nonviolence, he was in fact, uh, committed to nonviolence. And King uh, would say, sometimes you just got to stand for something when uh, all around you perhaps uh, is different and contrary to that. And nonviolence was that which he stood for. How, yet, it's not sort of a however, and he understood that unrest, if you will, or what we, what we may say riots, but that unrest often... Uh, opened our eyes to the injustice that was violence that we otherwise might not see. The solution, the remedy to that which unrest opened our eyes to for King was to break that cycle of violence. One broke that cycle of violence through the justice for King that was love, right? King said the justice is the love that corrects that which injustice uh, revolts against, and, and, and that is love. And so for King, nonviolence was the way in which to disrupt the cycle of violence, which oftentimes unrest was that that opened our eyes to. And so he was committed to nonviolent reform because for him, that was the way of love that allowed us to make justice real. Thank you. And he also saw nonviolence as a, from a practical matter, that the people who had least power could overcome the military power and the physical power of a police state with moral suasion, the way the Gandhi viewed it. So I see the perfect combination of him, of the moral and the religious you know, coming together with what he saw would actually work. And I, 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 I do think he was right. And it's it's absolutely clear from what I've read, certainly from John's book and everything all of you've said that, you know, King was absolutely motivated by his faith as a Christian uh, pastor and the teachings of, of Jesus Christ. I don't think it's a, a coincidence that one of his closest Jewish allies was Abra, Rabbi Abraham Heschel, as you know, Dr. Gullis, you know, worked right across the street at the uh, Jewish Theological Seminary and his classic book, The Prophet, talked about the Old Testament prophets as real tribunes of, 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 of prophetic voices for you know, uh, social change and, 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 and equality. And it is interesting how people who profess uh, to be followers of this, those same faiths today take the opposite views of justice as Dr. King. And I personally think they're misreading uh, those gospels and the Old Testament and how many people who are secular and atheist and, and uh, agnostic today hold up those same uh, you know, uh, you know, values. There's a lot misunderstood about Dr. King's legacy. Uh, you know, he was clearly on many, many occasions for uh, what measures that would be later characterized as affirmative action. People take one line out of the March on Washington out of context to falsely imply he wouldn't be for affirmative action uh, today. Uh, I know that uh, John Kasich, former Republican uh, you know, uh, leader who's seen as a moderate today, wrote an op-ed in the Boston Globe, I believe, mischaracterizing uh, King as almost a small government conservative who wanted community solutions instead of government solutions. So with that, uh, I'll open up. What do you guys think is, is the most mischaracterized part of, of, of Dr. King's uh, legacy? I'll start with you, Mr. Senrat. Is there anything that strikes you out of how his name and legacy are misused today? Well, you just you just called out a big one right there is the mischaracters one is it I, I can easily go on and start talking about his his radicalism you know i go with uh in his understanding that this system was not designed to support everybody across across the country it was designed to support some, some but not all but they make it seem like it's kumbaya um you said again about this concept of affirmative action 
and how he would be against affirmative action today. When we look at the assaults that are happening on DEI across the country and the work that we need to do to make sure that we're leveling the playing field, that's gonna create opportunity for everybody. This, would some, this is something that he would absolutely engage in the fight with us to make sure that these different parties could not do that. Even before that, this is a, this is a quote from uh, Dr. King. We have deluded ourselves into believing the myth that capitalism grew and prospered out of the Protestant ethic of hard work and sacrifice. The fact is that capitalism was built on the exploitation and suffering of black slaves and continues to thrive on the exploitation of the poor, both black and white, both here and abroad. This goes back to my statement earlier about systems change. We have to, if, if we're ever going to, and this is once again, his radicalization, he understood, and a lot of it, Dr. Douglas, had to do with his divinity, his desire and his belief in God that you have to, that every human being has to have an opportunity, has to be respected, have to, has to have dignity, dignity has to be integrated into a system where they have a fair opportunity to take care of themselves and their families. They have to be able to do that if they're going to be effective, if they're going to be able to support themselves. It's just basic human rights. Uh, and so this idea that he wanted everybody to just hold hands and hold themselves up and everything would be fine and lovely is just totally counter to anything and everything that we've read about Dr. King. Uh, from the very beginning. I'll even go further back when you talk about him courting his then wife, Coretta, um, Coretta Scott. I imagine you already know that I am much more socialistic in my economic theory than capitalistic. Today, capitalism has outlived its usefulness. It has brought about a system that takes necessities from the masses to give luxuries to the classes. This is who this man is that sometimes people don't understand. He is somebody that saw that this system was exclusive and not inclusive. And we have to see that if we're going to step in and really honor the legacy of who is Dr. King and understanding that we all have to participate, jump in and, and fight for the country that we want. My father used to say all the time, we're in a country that never meets its reaches its destination. Every two years, we have to participate in voting. Every four years, we have to participate in, in voting. But what it is, is it's a choice. It's a decision that we all collectively make in deciding the path that we want to follow as a nation into the future. And that's every part of what he was talking about from the beginning. This is what we're pushing for. This is what we're fighting for. Uh, and if we're going to make, and, and if you think about that thing that drove uh, Dr. King, it was that it was just this. It was the fact that everybody, if this is going to work, and this is the country that we know, if it's going to work, then everybody has to get in the game and, and really you have to fight for the change that you want. All right. And, and it wasn't about this idea of, of kumbaya. And I've always, you know, and when I was a young person, I used to think that, but he's so counter to that. And so if there's anything I always want to leave uh, and tell and inform people about, it's like, no, this man was a straight radical, right? <laughs> he fought for things at a level that most people could not understand. And so I hope if nothing else, people hear that uh, and leave with the idea that if you, you, you can't sit back, you can't sit back and wait for something to happen. You can't sit back and wait for your perfect, all right? You have to step in and you have to fight. Yeah, and he was absolutely extraordinarily critical of unfettered capitalism. You would, <laughs> looking at that, you'd definitely say in today's terms, he'd be seen as a leftist. I, I point out, uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, Republican president, was very, uh, very critical of unfettered capitalism. But I also think it, it, it's true that he was pretty critical of communism as well, in, oh, in, yes. in part you know, because communism repressed uh, religious uh, liberty. And uh, I've never seen any quotes from him praising Maoist China or the Soviet Union or communist Cuba. 
So I, I, it's hard to extrapolate what someone who died in 1968 would believe decades later, but I believe he'd probably be closer to sort of Scandinavian democratic socialism, a much greater you know safety net than, 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 than perhaps you know communism, but certainly be very critical of the inequality of wealth today. Do you, do you agree with that, Jonathan? I, I know, again, as a journalist background, you don't want to speculate what a long dead person would believe, but what did he believe when he was alive? Yeah, I don't want to speculate either. And I think we can see clearly where he was going with the Poor People's Campaign, um, moving toward um, uh, human rights and not just uh, civil rights. But I want to just expand on something Dennis was just saying, and that is that, you know, uh, we we have to be, King said we have to stay awake and we have to stay vigilant. And I think we have to stay awake and stay vigilant in protecting King's message and his words and the way it's being abused and weaponized, where people feel like they can use a quote from King to cover their own racism. Um, and also, we run the risk of seeing King watered down, turned into something safe that we can all handle. And Harry Belafonte said to me when I interviewed him for this book, um, this country only likes dead radicals. And, and, and there's a reason for that, because uh, look what you can start to do once they're dead. You can start to contort them and shape them. And, um, you know, Belafonte and others who I talked to were concerned that the federal holiday may be used as a weapon against King's real meaning, against his legacy. And that's up to us. You know, we have to fight back against that. And we have to fight to make sure people actually read King again, and not just the second half of the I Have a Dream speech, um, start out um, by reading the, the entire uh, I Have a Dream speech, but then from beyond from that, we have to get his books in classrooms. Um, when I went to the National Monument for King last year, they didn't have any of his books for sale. And I complained about it and I wrote about it in my book and now they're selling them. But that's just the kind of vigilance that we all need. We need to protect King the way he, and fight for him the way he fought for us. And I just know the charge and the obsession by Hoover that he was a communist, I think, also played into the racism. Not only Hoover and, and you know, and, as you noted, uh, the wiretapping authorized by the Kennedys and expanded by LBJ, but it's really the assumption that the civil rights movement couldn't be brilliant people standing up for themselves after centuries of oppression, that, that the, the racist idea that African Americans were too backwards to have come up with the idea for a liberty movement themselves, it had to come from Russia. Wasn't wasn't that, Jonathan, the, the false yeah, but, sort of racist but, assumption? I, yeah, I agree with you, Joel, but uh, let's be real about it, because the important thing is that once they realized he wasn't a communist, they still expanded the service. That's right. Because they were concerned that he posed a threat to the status quo and that power might have to be shared. And the white establishment did not want to share that power. That's why they saw King as a threat. That's why they right. doubled down when he started talking about the poor people's campaign. Even though his popularity in America was fading by that point, they saw this as a threat to the status quo. And they saw him and they, they said as much in their memos that he's the one who might unite the opposition. And the people in power, as King himself said, do not share power voluntarily. And that's why the FBI was surveilling King in the end. That's right. That's right. And Dr. Dr. Douglas, you want to add to that? What do you think about Mr. Oh. Obama's legacy? <laughs> uh, yeah, first of all, just to uh, affirm uh, the things that have been said uh, by uh, both Dennis and Jonathan in relationship to King understanding uh, properly uh, King's legacy and preserving. Uh, uh, the truth of that legacy. The uh, only thing uh, that I would add uh, to what has already been said and said well uh, is that King, I'll pick up again from what I said earlier, that King, imperative to King, was what he called for this sort of true revolution of values and this true moral transformation of American society so that it could live into that which it professed to be, a true democratic society where all people and the sacred dignity of all human beings would be respected and all people would be free. Above all, King believed that America needed to build a culture, if you will, of atonement for its centuries of racial violence, its centuries of bigotry, its centuries of injustice. And so 
King to uh, sort of pick up even as Jonathan and Dennis uh, were speaking to the fact of uh, learning about him, reading his books. King, to borrow from uh, the words of one of my colleagues who's written a book on King and the Black social gospel movement, Gary, Gary Dorian, that King imagined for America, a nation that would end this sort of culture of atonement, if you will, that it would build, uh, or of reparations uh, in our language today, that he imagined a country that would acknowledge its crimes, that would compel every American to learn about them in school, and that would build a generous, hospitable, multiracial, multicultural social democracy that would begin to bridge the gap between America's self-image or what it thought it was and the facts of its own history and reality to become that a uh, democratic society it believed itself to be. And so I think if we understand that about King, the culture of atonement, reparations, and this transformation of American values that he believed revolution had to take place, that if we keep that center, then at least becomes for us a buffer <laughs> from uh, romanticizing and using King to begin to provide a canopy, an ideological and sacred canopy over our own bigotries and limitations and prejudices and, be and be build a buffer uh, for us to prevent us from uh, building a, a sacred canopy over that which would prevent us from living truthfully into who we, looking truthfully into who we are, who we have been, and moving toward what we have to become. And that's what King uh, stood for. And, and, and so I just join in what others have said, that we have gotten to a point where just in not being truthful about our history, it is easy now to begin to romanticize uh, King. Uh, and when we do that, we really do ourselves as a nation a disservice. If we ever expect, if we really believe we want to be, ever expect to live into that nation that we profess to be. Great. We're going to move to audience questions in one second. But Mr. Harrell, do you have anything to add about what's misunderstood about King's legacy? I truly believe that the emphasis on the I have a dream speech and the idealism in that speech really makes people not respect how revolutionary and radical he really was and how he opposed the, the system and challenged racism on all levels. People really do not want to see who King really was. And the fact that he is now a, a national monument and a, a national holiday has allowed his message to be whitewashed, to be diluted, and to be used in ways that he would never have intended for it to be used. I truly agree with what has been stated by other speakers, a division of who King was, the many speeches that he made, the, the, the Vietnam speech, his message to the United Nations, his looking internationally and globally, as well as internally, has not been understood by ordinary people. They see Thank Martin Luther King as a dreamer. And he was so much more than a dreamer. He had a vision of what America could be. Could be. He was holding America accountable for the historic wrongs that it, has, that it had committed. And he was saying, what are you going to do to make this change? This is where I am. This is what I see has to be done economically, racially, to change who America is and change to what it can be. But people do not want to see that. They want to pigeonhole him as a nonviolent creature who had some civil rights impact. 
he was far, far more than that. Thank you, Kim. Can we go quickly to a question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll try to combine uh, two to get a few more in there. Um, so we had a question about how the digital age and social media um, has influenced how we commemorate and discuss uh, figures like Martin Luther King. Um, and to add to that, someone also wondered about his legacy when we talk about um, the current situation with ban, you know, supposedly banning things like critical race theory in schools. And does that, you know, so I, I guess the question really is, given what's going on right now, both with digital and social media and also what's going on in schools, how do we envision those things affecting Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy in our country today? Who wants to take a swat at that? Yeah, it's a, you know, I, I find um, social media is, is always the double edge, right? But it's, it is the almighty accelerator of information. Uh, my daughter, is is flying back today from a trip from Selma and and Atlanta on a with a group. She's in the tenth grade, uh, and she is posting about her experience to her school, and her circle, and her network about the experiences that she's receiving. So when you see things like that, it's it's a huge plus. The National Urban League is launching what we call a D three campaign, uh, which is defend democracy. Um, what is it? Defend democracy, demand diversity, and defeat poverty, right? But it's providing information. In, and so social media and digital uh, can be a great asset if you're utilizing it in a way that's going to supply uh, information with people where they can know and understand it. You know, my father used to say, you can't unknow stuff. Like once you're exposed to things, you just, <laughs> you, you have to then make a choice. You either step in or you or you step out, but you have to make a choice. You can't unknow it. So social media is allowing us to really uh, expand our ability to message. Uh, and, and that very much becomes a part of how we keep the legacy of Dr. King, all right, is, is making sure we're utilizing all mechanisms to get the word out that this is what he really meant to America and this globe. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? And can one week, go ahead. Social media right. and and in particular YouTube allows young people to revisit history. They can watch and listen to Martin Luther King speeches. They can visit the past in a way that was impossible for us many years ago. And they can also chime in on discussions with persons who were a part of this. So social media can be extremely beneficial in disseminating the truth of who Martin Luther, King, Martin Luther King was, what he believed in, what his vision truly was, and the realities in which he lived. Because to truly understand his work and his legacy, people have to look at the times he lived in, the consequences he was fighting against and social media and the internet allows young people to understand on a level that would have been impossible 30, 40 years ago. Thank you, Kim. Let's have one last question then we'll wrap up. Sure. Um, so what can we draw from Dr. King's work towards voting rights uh, in the current climate of uh, voter suppression laws that have been passed throughout the country? You know, on in July 2023, uh, the Democratic side introduced the Freedom to Vote Act, which is a way to kind of level the playing field when it comes to comprehensive voting. So establishing national standards and the like. Um, it, it is really, and then there's the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. When it comes to the legal protections, we have to really push our legislators to support these kind of laws that are going to uh, that are going to level the playing field, but don't, but not disenfranchise people when it comes to voting. I understand. I think we all understand that there's going to be a lot of legal challenges, but we can't just say, "Hey, I can't do this." It, this is one of those things where we have to step in. Um, the National Urban League, where we are pushing uh, voter education, 
especially this year, because this is such a pivotal year in the United States of America and deciding which direction that we're going to go into. So national voter education, there's two, two legs to this tool. One is making sure people are aware of the rules for voting in their particular cities, and then it's supporting organizations like the ACLU uh, that are fighting to change the laws so that they are challenging the suppressive rules that have been created in a lot of these different municipalities across this country. So it's two legs. One, don't get distracted or discouraged by knowing and understanding what you need to do to walk up to the booth so that you can participate. And two, support those organizations that are fighting to make sure the laws are changed. And that's how we have to spend this year. If we're going, and then show up, by the way, All right? <laughs> and then show up. This is, we are very interestingly a nation that does not maximize voter participation. And there are all kinds of rule thing, issues because of it. We talk about the prison industrial complex. We talk about the rules around anyone with a felony who can and can never vote. We talk about the disconnection in, in, in the way the agencies communicate with each other. So those that could get their voting rights back don't know that they're able to get it right. So there's all kinds of confusion. But for those who are not in that system, we work with those and we have expungement clinics working with that population. But for those that can participate, don't sit out. Don't let, don't let the need for perfect get in the way with the fact that there are issues that you need to step into right now. You got to get in the fight. You got to get in the battle. And, and that vote is your fundamental right as a citizen. You got to participate. Great. We're a little over. Thank you so much. That's a great way. And does anyone have any closing uh, other closing comments related to that or anything else? Yeah, I'll just say, as you know, uh, LBJ and MLK agreed that perhaps the most fundamental of the rights was the right to vote, because so much of this centered around political uh, power. First, I want to thank our incredible panelists for your time uh, today. Everyone came here as an unpaid uh, volunteer, although I will uh, plug you all to go out and buy a King of Life if you haven't done so already. That's number one. Number two, if you can afford to donate to the National Urban League, uh, do so. If you can also afford to donate to Hunger Free America, do so. Uh, I didn't laugh much in John's last book, but there was one line, a rejection letter from the Fat Ford Foundation to Dr. King, basically, that their last application didn't have enough deliverable metrics in it uh, to, to, to be uh, funded. Anyone working in the nonprofit sector, you just got to uh, laugh at, at that. So, and lastly, for more information, if you need food, or can donate or want to volunteer some more, go to hungerfreeamerica.org. That's hungerfreeamerica.org. And lastly, let's exalt all of us to remember King's full dream. And we have our collective work cut out for us to make sure that arc of justice is bent. The arc of the future is bent towards justice. So thank you so much. And uh, hope to see you all soon at some advocacy function. Thank you so much. Have a great day.